Welcome to The Authority File. I'm Bill Mickey, your host and the editorial director at Choice. For this series, my guests and I are examining the path to open access, open science, and transformative agreements from the perspective of a publisher, Springer Nature. Actually, the word transformative is no joke. Making the shift to open access has had a major impact up and down the content supply chain, from research to production and editing, distribution technology, sales, and of course, libraries and end users. In this series, we'll be getting some valuable insight into how Springer Nature began its journey to support open access and open science, the important lessons learned, the milestones along the way, and how this mission is changing the way we interact with scholarly content in profound ways. Joining me for this discussion will be Caroline Nevison, Director of Commercial Transition to OA at Springer Nature, and Dr. Ritu Dand, Vice President of Editorial Nature Journals at Springer Nature. In this second episode of this series, which is sponsored by Springer Nature, we take a deep dive into transformative agreements, how they started, and their practicality and benefits. Caroline, just uh, staying with you for for a couple more minutes, um, what was... Can you just talk about the driver behind shifting to transformative agreements? And, and to be clear, as you, I think you've alluded to already, you're, you're speaking from uh, a broader, you know, Springer perspective, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Um, okay. So transformative agreements, uh, there's a lot of nomenclature that floats around in the, right. in the open access <laughs> environment. Um, but read and publish agreements is also a, a, a decent um, way to refer to refer to them. Yeah, to be clear what they mean for us, it's offering institutions, often up under the umbrella of a consortia, uh, to continue with their subscription holdings, um, to paywall content, whilst also allowing their researchers to publish open access in, mm-hmm. in hybrid journals, transformative journals, just to sort of set the scene there. And yeah, our discussions started a long time ago, but our first agreements on the Springer portfolio um, began in, in 2015. Uh, yeah, I mentioned before with countries such as Netherlands, UK and Sweden were the, were the first countries to join. And what they tended to do was to try and cover the majority of their higher education publishing output in, in new agreements. In terms of drivers, I would say that usually the driver comes from firm mandates to publish immediate open access. Um, so that could be yeah. from the main funders of research in the country. Or it could also be from the government or from the institutions themselves making that, that decision. Ideally, funding is provided um, to help the researchers meet these mandates and to cover the costs of publishing open access um, under the immediate gold model. But that's not always the case. And transformative agreements do allow the repurposing of existing subscription spend towards this. So not all countries do enter into agreements with an extremely strict mandate behind them, um, but rather some want to be part of this transition towards open access they can see the benefit, of course, that open access publishing can have uh, on the impact and, and reach of their research. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and you, you briefly touched on sort of this regional perspective. Um, mm. Can you talk a little bit more about that, um, how that's addressed from, from, from your point of view, um, and then maybe how here in the U.S. it might mm. be different in some respects in terms of... and seeming mm-hmm. I think it kind of matters institution to institution instead of a you know countrywide yeah. kind of perspective yeah you're right yeah not every country region institution is at the same stage on the journey you do have in some places mandates that that can come in with a really short lead time um, and so in those cases we really try and work with the consortia to to address this um, mm-hmm. to, to, to aid compliance is the most important thing for us to aid compliance to their authors wherever we can I'd say some regions yeah we're at an education stage we conduct regional studies we conduct outreach to introduce the concepts of round open access 
to make sure that libraries have the information they need, but also very often conducting conversations at a very high level. And that's that's not me. Um, others within the organization really working at a government level um, right. to, to have those conversations about the, the future direction. Of course, all at the same time, the majority of content right now in the hybrid portfolio is still being published under the subscription model. So we still have our relationships with libraries throughout the world on on their traditional subscription agreements, whilst also just just talking to them openly about (laughs) open access and Mm -hmm. and talking to them about what other countries are doing. Um, You mentioned the US, of course, yeah, we need to find solutions, um, both Springer Nature and the industry as a whole need to find solutions for different countries, um, depending on their administrative setup, as well as the funding. In the US right now, that does mean exploring transformative agreements at an institutional level, um, certainly where the volume of publishing kind of makes sense for, for both sides on that. If there is a strong desire to convert publishing to, to open access, we, we have to find the means to do that. Funding isn't made available to, to institutions directly in the same way um, in the US. So we have had to explore models and invest in technology um, on that. We have been able to support multi-payer arrangements um, whereby costs can be covered by the library, but... If researchers also have their own funds and grants, this can be given towards the APC, so a, a, a multi-payer sl- split payer model, as we have in in one of our agreements with uh, California Digital Library. So there's yeah, there's different paces of conversation and and different often technical solutions that also have to be sought. Right. Excellent. Um, okay, Doctor Dond, this is. A portion of this clearly we're talking about a, a business model um, but I'm wondering how you are making sure a shift of this magnitude doesn't impact the authors especially for authors who may not be covered under a, a transformative agreement type of situation yeah right. you know how, how do how do TAs potentially help authors and and you know what do we need to be careful of in these agreements um, you know how does that look from your perspective yeah, so we, so we, you know, we've heard from Caroline in in a lot of detail about how the mechanics of transformative mm. agreements work and how complex they are, and they are a business model that facilitates open access publishing. However, ultimately, as an editor, we want to ensure we can offer publishing as an option for every author. Every. Right. Um, and therefore, on the nature journals and, and many Springer nature journals, we um, do still offer that subscription option. Indeed, we haven't really seen a huge reduction in demand for using this publishing model because not everyone can afford to pay. And, and that's mm-hmm. just, you know, a fact of life. And if everyone doesn't have a mandate to pay, then getting fees is even harder. So, you know, the author choice part of publishing open access is much smaller than the part that we're going to see coming through from mandates, be it from countries, institutes, um, or authors. So we're, we're supportive of open access publishing, but we also want to ensure that we can support all authors wherever they come from, and and whatever their needs. Mm -hmm. Caroline has alluded to, for those that want to publish open access, it's not always straightforward. It's not always easy. And this is where transformative agreements can take much of the pain of open access publishing away from the authors. Not all authors are aware of how to access funds for, for publishing Usually there's a a lot of red tape involved in releasing those funds, either from a funding body or an institute. And for many authors, they don't publish often enough for for this to become something they're very familiar with. So Springer Nature does provide a free service that gives personalized assistance and advice to all authors to help them identify OA funding, be that from an institution, or a funding body, 
But all that said, from an author's perspective, the benefit of a centralized workflow that transformative agreements can enable just cannot be underestimated. You know, our workflow immediately recognizes whether an author's affiliation is is like to make them eligible for their APC to be covered under an agreement. And then we guide the authors through the process. It's a workflow that instantly saves authors time and effort. And simultaneously, we are able to give the institution an accurate publishing view, which they never had before. So for this reason, editorial embraces transformative agreements because they do allow us to take some of that pain of open access publishing away from our authors. Okay, great. So Caroline, how do you account for situations where a transformative agreement isn't possible? Is this the point perhaps where you'd shift to an individual journal level? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Transformative agreements, TAs, as you say, they're not currently workable for every country or institution. And we should also remember that there are authors who are at institutions that are not traditionally part of a higher education or or research consortium. Um, You know, most agreements, as I say, because they tend to be built up from the library, um, they tend to be hooked to the, 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 of course, the institutional, the regional consortia. And so you would have certain government researchers, hospital researchers, maybe corporate R&D that, that are not yet part of agreements. You know, maybe in future, entirely national agreements will be possible in lots of countries. And we do have a few of them, but it's not usually the case. So I would say that's where the importance of transformative journals comes in. And uh, for those that don't know, it's it's um, hybrid journals. But the concept of transformative journals is something actually that, that Springer Nature coined a few years ago in response to try and show there is a need for hybrid journals, but so long as they are aiding the transition towards open access and can, can kind of show that they're doing that. So, right. you know, it's essential not to restrict the choice of publishing venue. Um, it, we know from surveys it's influenced by many factors. And so by giving authors still the choice to publish in transformative journals, they can publish subscription or open access if they need to be compliant with a policy or they can see that the, the benefit that publishing open access could do for their paper, for their career they can still choose to publish open access, uh, even if a transformative agreement doesn't exist. And in addition to that, transformative journals overall, they're committing to various thresholds and criteria as defined by, by Plan S for increasing open access output in the journal and ultimately, of course, commit to flipping to fully open access once certain thresholds uh, are reached. So yes, I think that whilst that's not perhaps at an institutional level, it's the transformative journals that really give that additional option. Right. Okay. So, you know, in these conversations, um, you know, the, the, or in this within this ecosystem, the smaller scholarly publishers are often kind of talked about as 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 entities that might potentially be left behind in, in this in this shift, in this broader shift. And so how, Caroline, would you kind of talk about um, how we might be able to account for those smaller publishers who who may not be able to scale up as easily? Mm, yes, it's a tough one. Um, yeah, I think it's fair to say, and you've, you've probably heard a lot today that indicates that the shift to open access isn't an easy one for mm-hmm. a publisher to undertake of any size. I, I think it might be easy to make the decision that you're committed to, to this, committed to the principle that you're passionate about an open future, but you know it requires significant infrastructure to support that. Um, right. The reporting requirements for transformative journals alone, uh, that's just one case where the level of detail and reporting, I could imagine, could be really challenging for a smaller publisher to find the resource for. The publishing workflow, the institutional accounts, the customer services um, that that we've talked about a bit around the institutional agreements, that's been a huge undertaking. Mm -hmm. Um, 
of course, at Springer Nature, we're fortunate uh, in our scale that we do are able to have dedicated teams that that work on this. They uh, create and improve the author journey, the library journal journey, um, the reporting of articles from from a particular institution, and and even some of that for us is is still manual right now, as we we scale up. Um, and then, of course, the communication piece as well with, with the library or, or having that support available for authors who, who have questions or when I talk about funding opportunities. So, yeah, of course, I don't know the answer for, mm-hmm. for smaller scholarly publishers, but I know there has been a lot of discussion around that. And I can imagine it Yeah, must be really yeah. challenging. You want to embrace the approach. You want to find ways of sustainably building up the processes. But yeah, it comes with uh, with resource requirements. Right. Yeah, I think what it does uh, show is 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 or expose is the is the significant um, infrastructure, I suppose that that's necessary to uh, facilitate an OA um, model, uh, mm. and that it does require a pretty significant capital investment from publishers mm. in mm. general. Uh, to support that, um, which I think folks sometimes overlook. You just heard from Caroline Nevison, Director of Commercial Transition to OA at Springer Nature, and Dr. Ritu Dand, Vice President Editorial Nature Journals at Springer Nature. Springer Nature is the sponsor of this four-part series of The Authority File. Join us next week when we continue our conversation and discuss pilot projects Springer Nature is developing to reduce its APCs, how that impacts its editorial model, and a Netherlands-based case study that illustrates the impact of transformative agreements. So we decided to embark on a project looking, as you say, into the impact of open access publishing in the Netherlands based on the the date of the articles that, that we published under a transformative agreement. And in particular, we're also looking at the link between open access publishing and research in some of the UN's sustainable development goals uh, to explore the societal impact that open research can have. And you can imagine where that starts to get really exciting. If you like what you hear, rate us or give us a review on your podcast platform of choice. As always, sponsorship and advertising for the Authority File podcast are handled by Choices Advertising Manager Pam Marino, and all of our episodes are produced and edited by Choices Digital Media Assistant Sabrina Kofer. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>